on this Saturday night, home at last. The two Michaels land on Canadian soil. It's such a immense relief to be back in Canada. In what appears to be a hostage swap. The two sets of cases are very much interrelated and uh, politically motivated. Will this thaw China-Canada relations? Under investigation, the serious allegations facing Canada's military police. And President Biden faces backlash after expelling thousands of Haitian migrants. Global National with Robin Gill. Good evening and thank you for joining us. After nearly three years of imprisonment in China, Michael Kovrig and Michael Spavor are back in Canada. The two landed at Calgary International Airport early this morning, where they were greeted on the tarmac by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau. Kovrig continued on to Toronto, where he was reunited with his wife and sister. The two men were jailed in what's widely seen as retaliation for the arrest of Huawei executive Meng Wanzhou. The Canadians were on a plane at almost the exact same time Meng left Vancouver after reaching a deal with U.S. prosecutors. Jeff Semple has more on the joyous homecoming. After 1,020 days in detention in China, Michael Kovrig is finally home. I feel great. Uh, frankly, I feel fantastic. Uh, it's such a he immense relief to be back in Canada, to be here home with my family again. Uh, I feel like I'm on top of the world and I'm just immensely grateful uh, to everyone who has been working so hard for these over a thousand days to bring both me and Michael Spaver home. Uh, it's fantastic. Thank you so much. And I'm really looking forward to the, the future with my family. He and Michael Spavor landed early this morning, first in Calgary, where they were embraced by the Canadian Prime Minister and even seen sharing a laugh. From there, Kovrig travelled onwards to Toronto, met on the tarmac by his sister and his wife, Vina Najibula. Speaking to Global News just hours after arriving in Toronto, his first day home after nearly three years in a Chinese prison cell, Kovrig seemed full of life, even cracking jokes and he also wanted to say thanks. I didn't know most of what was happening in the outside world, but all the, the, the knowing that so many Canadians and others were aware of our situation and sending messages of support uh, really meant a lot to us. So thank you, thank everybody for that. Those comments echoed by his wife, Vina, who led the family's fight to bring him home. For the first time in a long time, she was smiling ear to ear. Immense gratitude. We're happy he's here. <laughs> it's, it's been a thousand and twenty days of working for this moment. The moment is here. I am so grateful to everybody, Ambassador Barton, Canadian government, U.S. government, everybody who worked to make this day happen. Yeah. And to all Canadians who have been with us every step of the way. I'm just still learning how to breathe again <laughs> because I feel like I've been holding my breath for almost three years. So, yeah, that's about that. Kevin and Julia Garrett know the feeling. The Canadians were detained in China in 2014 under similar circumstances and remember what it was like to hug someone for the first time in years. Yeah, and just thinking about all the firsts, yeah. like just imagining their family hugging and that, that moment of just coming mm -hmm. together and the first drink of coffee that you can go get by yourself. I remember waking up the, fir the very first morning after I arrived and, uh, you know, I just wanted a coffee. So Starbucks opened, which was nearby where we were staying and uh, walking in there, getting a coffee and seeing my face on the front page of the paper, thinking, why is that there? <laughs> it came out of nowhere. Yeah, I, I really didn't expect in my wildest dreams that it would happen. Michael Spavor's friends in South Korea were supposed to meet up with him in Seoul at their favorite pub the night he was arrested. So I look forward to taking him back there and, and, and reliving old times. Meng Wanzhou also touched down this morning in China. Beijing had long insisted her case was not connected to the two Michaels. But Meng's plane passed the Michaels in the sky, their departures coming just minutes apart. I think it, it, it just goes on to show that the two sets of cases are very much interrelated and uh, politically motivated. Are you surprised, though, that they didn't make more of an effort to make it look like these cases weren't connected? 
Actually, on reflection, not really. American John Cam has spent 30 years advocating for political prisoners in China, including the two Michaels. He says Beijing no longer shows much concern for its image in the West. China is, I think, less concerned about its image. That's not to say they're totally unconcerned. I think they are concerned when it suits their purpose to be concerned. For now, the families are less interested in geopolitics and more in taking some time together. For them and their countless Canadian supporters, a much needed happy ending and the beginning of the road to recovery. Jeff Semple, Global News, Toronto. Let's bring in our Ottawa Bureau Chief Mercedes Stevenson, who is also the host of the West Block. And the West Block was invited to speak with Michael Kovrig and his family. First of all, how is he doing? You know, just um, amazing, as, as you heard a little bit about in Jeff's piece there, Robin. Uh, he was smiling, he was joking about being well-rested, um, but you could just feel the energy and the radiance from this family that are so relieved to finally have their loved one home. Uh, I asked his wife, Vina what it was like when she saw him coming off the plane and how that felt. Take a listen to this. What was the moment like when you first saw Michael stepping off the plane and you were able to embrace him? Hard to describe. Indescribably intense, let's just say, and leave it at that. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, yes. I think yeah, we just need some time now to yeah, heal and to rest, exactly. but thank you so much, Mercedes and everyone. Thank you. Mercedes, how did his release develop? Was there a deal? Did he give any indication of that? Well, we don't really know, and uh, you know, today the family and, and Michael really just wanted to talk a little bit about being home. Of course, we will be asking all of those questions, but in terms of questions we've asked the government, uh, that's something we're trying to pursue, and we have the Foreign Minister, Mark Garneau, joining us on the show tomorrow to talk a little bit more about this. We do know, obviously, the main deal was from the U.S. government, uh, and that was to drop the extradition request for Meng Wanzhou, who then went home, but obviously there was a connection to the two Michaels, and what was surprising to everyone who's been covering this case is how quickly they actually were able to be released and come home. Um, there was a lesser, essentially, uh, plea deal than was expected with Meng Wanzhou. Initially, the Department of Justice had wanted her to plead guilty on a bunch of things. Whether or not there was a deal cut to get the Michaels out more quickly and get what she wanted, we'll try to find out. Uh, but certainly today, everyone just celebrating the fact that the two Michaels are home. Mercedes Stevenson in Ottawa. Thanks, Mercedes. And Mercedes will have more of that conversation tomorrow on the West Block, right here on Global. The Canadian military is being accused of covering up an investigation involving a member of the military police. And tonight, there are calls for the military police to be disbanded. Our Ottawa correspondent, Mike Lecatour, has been following this story. Mike? Well, Robin, we have few details of where the alleged incident happened and who it involved. But we do know from a statement posted online by the Military Police Complaints Commission announcing the watchdog is investigating whether there was a deliberate attempt by military police to cover up, quote, misconduct by one of their own. If you can't trust the military police, th there's some serious issues with the chain of command and the, the image of the, the military police as a whole. Stu Kellogg is a former military police officer who also served in senior roles with the Toronto Police Department. He has serious concerns about the military justice system and says this latest incident is just another example of how the system is broken. According to the online statement, a military police officer who appeared intoxicated put her children in her car and allegedly attempted to drive them and herself home after leaving a restaurant. Bystanders stopped her. Local police arrived and alerted military police after learning she was an officer. The military force took it from there. According to the Military Police Complaints Commission, there have been serious issues with the investigation that followed. In a statement, the MPCC said these complaints allege that the MP unit's leadership attempted to cover up the alleged misconduct of an officer of that unit and improperly giving special treatment to the MP officer involved.
that undermines the confidence and the credibility of those who are supposed to have the highest ethical, moral and legal standards in the entire Canadian forces. The complaints about the investigation allege the military police investigators' electronic report was altered without their knowledge and unit members were threatened not to report the incident. The timing is definitely not very uh, advantageous for uh, uh, and armed forces that are trying to uh, reestablish some credibility uh, generally and specifically in terms of how they can deal with investigations. In a statement, a spokesperson for the military police told Global News no one has been suspended in relation to this case, but the military police professional standards section is monitoring this file and communicating with the Complaints Commission. Robin. Mike Lucature in Ottawa. Thanks, Mike. U.S. Customs officials are reopening a border crossing in Texas after a makeshift migrant encampment was cleared away. As many as 15,000 people, mostly Haitians, had amassed there in hopes of seeking asylum. But about 2,000 migrants were put on deportation flights to Haiti. As Jennifer Johnson reports, President Joe Biden is facing backlash over how the administration handled this situation. The before and after pictures are startling. Last week, over 15,000 Haitians, most who had been living in South America, packed a border encampment in Del Rio, Texas. On Friday, it was empty. Thousands of the migrants now face immigration judges or are voluntarily returning to Mexico, fearing they'll be deported. What we do when we see something that is unprecedented is we respond and in respond, we did. The Biden administration is facing heavy criticism for Border Patrol agents heavy handed tactics in trying to stop the Haitian migrants. Some photos appear to show border agents trying to whip them. Even members of President Joe Biden's own party are angry. The White House continues to be silent as far as, far as the humane treatment of the migrants that I witnessed down there. President Biden has broken that silence, promising an investigation of the aggressive treatment and a new ban on agents on horseback in Del Rio. Of course I take responsibility. I'm president, but it was horrible what to see, as you saw. To see people treated like they did, horses really running them over, people being strapped, it's outrageous. The Biden administration is also facing backlash for flying 2,000 Haitians back to their country under new pandemic rules. The U.S. Special Envoy to Haiti, Daniel Foote, resigned in protest. Criticism, too, from New York City Council member Farrell Lewis, whose district is home to a large Haitian community. It's political chaos. It's just chaos. It's not safe for anyone. And they're going back knowing that they have nothing to go back to. These people have given up everything. Now their futures are uncertain, including for 10 babies born at the camp. Despite dire conditions, no lives were lost this time. Law enforcement officials believe another caravan of about 20,000 migrants is in South Mexico and heading to Del Rio. Jennifer Johnson, Global News, Washington. The era of Angela Merkel is ending. Coming up, how the German Chancellor will be remembered. The volcano on Spain's La Palma Island is entering an explosive new phase. On Friday, officials say volcanic measurements recorded the highest energy activity from the eruption so far. A new emission vent has also formed along the volcano. Ash has now forced the island's only airport to close, though ferries are still available for travel. Nearly 6,000 people on the island have been forced to leave. Tomorrow, Germans head to the polls to choose the country's next leader. Angela Merkel's successor in the center-right Christian Democratic Union is neck and neck in the polls with the candidate from the center-left Socialist Democratic Party. Whoever wins will have some big shoes to fill. Merkel was influential in shaping policy well beyond her country's borders. So the race to replace her is being closely watched. Redmond Shannon looks at the legacy she leaves behind. Angela Merkel is believed to be terrified of dogs. In 2007, Vladimir Putin brought his black Labrador to a meeting with her. Clearly uncomfortable, she was still able to joke about it in fluent Russian. Those who have followed Merkel's career say her ability to engage Putin is partly down to her early life in communist East Germany. Putin, who's often tried to outsmart her, has come to respect her. Uh, because she's somebody who hasn't been bowled over, somebody who 
who sort of knows his game from, from the inside. Merkel has worked with four U.S. presidents, most closely with Barack Obama. Chancellor Merkel has been an outstanding partner. Obama's visit to Germany in the days after Donald Trump's election victory reportedly inspired Merkel to seek a fourth term. The leader of the free world was considered to be Angela Merkel because she was the one who, who through her focus on... on um, and pragmatism was the one who could stand up to uh, to Trump. I have German in my blood. I'll be there. Merkel and Trump's leadership styles could barely have been more different. She has a tendency to sort of sit down and think the problem through. She was an experimental physicist, quantum chemistry. In the wake of the Fukushima nuclear disaster, she U-turned on nuclear power, deciding to phase it out in Germany. But her analytical method also had its drawbacks, notably during the Eurozone debt crisis a decade ago. There's nothing rational about financial markets. It was the psychological thing that she missed in her attempt to make this a rational, solvable problem. European austerity policies supported by Merkel made her unpopular in the countries hit hardest by the economic crisis. Many of the same nations were on the front line of the 2015 refugee crisis. Perhaps Merkel's greatest legacy was to welcome one million of those refugees. Famously saying, we can do this. They did it, and voters backed Merkel's moral stand in 2017, although many others moved to the far right too. Supporters and opponents agree that the woman nicknamed Muti, or Mother, has left a lasting mark at the centre of Europe. Redmond Shannon, Global News, London. Still ahead, why Canadians are about to see bigger digits on their cell phone bills. You're watching Global National. This week, Bell announced it's raising wireless prices for some existing customers, depending on their plans. That can mean your cell phone bill is going up, even if you're a customer with another provider. Anne Gaviola explains why. At the onset of the pandemic, the big three telecom companies, Bell, Telus and Rogers, waived roaming charges and overage fees, a nod to how reliant we'd all become on our wireless devices during COVID. But that grace period ran out last year, and now observers say we've entered a new era for prices. The government has increasingly started to side with big telecom companies against consumers. <laughs> We have a freshly elected minority government. You may recall there was no mention of cell phone affordability anywhere in the Liberals' 89-page platform, even though polls showed the issue was important to voters. This week, Bell has let some customers know that price hikes are coming to certain plans. Starting in November, data overage rates will jump for them from $10 to $13 per 100 megabytes, and long-distance calls within Canada and the U.S. will go from $0.65 cents a minute to $0.75. TELUS tells Global News its current rate plan suite doesn't have data overages and there are no plans to change long distance data rates within Canada and the U.S. in the foreseeable future. Rogers did not respond to a request for comment. But analysts tell Global News this is a definite sign of things to come. In the past, the major players have hiked prices in rapid succession. And researchers at Open Media say there's no reason to think that this time around is going to be any different or that there aren't more price increases to come. And all of this is happening as wireless prices around the world continue to fall. The real question we need to be asking ourselves is, uh, is the huge gap between what Canadians pay for mobile and internet data and what places uh, other countries pay for it, is that gap shrinking? Um, and it's, it's not. Uh, we don't see any evidence that we're, we're making up that ground. The pushback from major carriers is that they're investing billions in 5G, the next generation of the internet, which will be key for truly unlimited data plans and things like connected cars and homes. It comes at a cost to consumers. If the big three weren't turning some of the highest profits of all telecom companies per customer in the whole world, uh, it might be more believable, uh, but we know that they are. And Gaviola, Global News, Toronto. Pandemic pet problems. Up next, the animals who gave comfort are now being given away. As many Canadians struggled with isolation, pet adoptions were all the rage early in the pandemic. Whether small or fluffy, they helped fight off the loneliness of lockdown. 
But as more people start traveling and returning to work, many of these cute companions are now being given away. And the worrying trend has animal welfare groups on high alert. Crystal Gomansing reports. Call it creature comfort. Shut in by the pandemic, people all over turned to animals. Just innocent, loving pets that just want to be loved. And uh, that's what I needed too, so it, it worked out. Pet adoption spiked when human contact wasn't an option. Linda Wynn says she wouldn't know what to do without her beloved dogs. But for others, priorities are shifting. Many are back working at the office, people want to travel and go out. The UK's largest dog welfare charity has seen traffic on its giving up your dog page jump 100% in the past six months. <laughs> Calls about surrendering animals started just after July 19th when nearly all restrictions in England were lifted. So far, dogs aren't being returned en masse, but the group fears that wave could be coming. Canadian groups such as the Toronto Humane Society says thankfully it hasn't seen a similar increase in calls. <coughs> Rehoming pets is incredibly hard. In Germany last month, one animal group turned to Tinder. Yet yeah, Tinder, the dating app. The Munich Animal Welfare Association thought maybe someone would swipe right on a good boy. Jillian Ma says, quite simply, it's fun. This is something new, something creative, which we definitely support. Support is something animal shelters are always looking for. The pandemic at first seemed to lead to so many perfect matches. Now agencies fear they'll need to dream up even more creative ways to rehome pandemic pets even after they provided their humans with the love and support they needed. Crystal Gamansing, Global News, London. And that is Global National for this Saturday night. I'm Robin Gill. Tonight, your Canada is a sure sign of fall, a red maple leaf in Oakville, Ontario. Thank you for watching. Good night.